much squared away. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our uh, Mountain Talk presentation. Uh, my name is Bryce Neff. I am the Associate Director of College Affinity and Faculty Engagement here uh, at Lehigh with the Alumni Relations Office. A um, couple of quick housekeeping notes before we begin the presentation. Um, the session today is going to be recorded, so if you need to step off, um, if you need to finish your lunch, or if you get pulled into a meeting or have something else that you need to attend to, uh, that's totally okay. Um, we'll process the, the recording and get it posted to our YouTube channel in the coming days, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you'll have the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we request that you uh, resp uh, reply to uh, everyone in the room so uh, the whole audience can see your questions and hopefully you know, start some discussion around the topic today. Um, but with that, um, I'm going to pass it off to our host and moderator for today's presentation, uh, the Dean of College of Health, uh, Beth Dolan. So Beth, why don't you go ahead and take us away? Thanks so much, Bryce, um, and thanks for allowing us to bring this topic to Mountain Talks. Um, we're, we're really um, honored to be here, and I'm honored to host the Rushes, um, who I'm going to introduce, and then we'll get started. Um, on, a, on a personal note, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Joan and Alan Rush when I was in California this summer, visiting with alumni. And, you know, what I learned from them was information that I had never heard. Um, and it was information that aligns with the mission of the College of Health, which is to improve health outcomes, right? Um, so big mission, but we really look at the multiple determinants of health, um, and so including biological determinants of health. And so we're going to learn a lot about that today. And in the College of Health, we're interested in, in new technologies and how they can help people be more healthy. And we're going to learn about that too a little bit. So um, really excited to get started, and I'll go ahead and, and introduce them. So Alan Rush uh, is a fourth generation Lehigh alumnus, but I believe his family has five generations who actually attended Lehigh, um, and some of them may be on, on right now on the webinar listening, which is great. Um, so he earned a BSEE from Lehigh, as well as an MS in computer engineering and a PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Santa Clara University. So Alan retired from AMD in 2020 and is currently consulting in artificial intelligence technologies. At AMD, he was a senior fellow and chief architect for imaging and AI. Prior to AMD, he was founder of several startup companies focusing on imaging technologies and products, including Sierra Imaging and PCC. His career included engineering positions with Intel, ROLM, and others. So with his wife, Joan, um, they formed the Jacqueline Rush Foundation in 2015 in honor of their daughter. Lynch syndrome is an inherited genetic mutation. Alan, like his daughter, has been diagnosed with it. Joan Rush previously worked at various companies, including Duquesne Light Company, Westinghouse Electrical Corporation, ROLM Corporation, and Electric Power Research Institute in marketing and tech support positions. After Jacqueline was born, Joan took on her most rewarding and important role of raising her daughter. Joan is co-founder and president of the Jacqueline Rush Foundation, She's driving the mission of the foundation to increase awareness of and education about Lynch syndrome and to help others realize the power of knowing what's in your genes. So I'm gonna turn it over to them and uh, Joan and Al are gonna do a sort of slide presentation with information about Lynch syndrome and about their foundation. Um, and then we're opening it up to questions. Um, and I hope that you will add questions in the chat even while the presentation is going and we won't interrupt the presentation, but we'll get to them afterwards. But as they occur to you, feel free to drop them in. So Joan and Alan, welcome. Um, it's always awkward because we can't applaud, but um, I'll give you a warm welcome and uh, excited to hear what you have to share with us. Thanks, Beth. We really appreciate you having us on today. Um, so. We're just going to start off talking about Jacqueline's story, um, about the foundation, what is Lynch syndrome, and then we're going to have a discussion with Beth about some other questions that you may have. So um, our daughter Jacqueline had Lynch syndrome. I'm sure most of you have never heard of it, and neither had we. 
until she was 20 years of age when she was diagnosed with stage three colorectal cancer after four years of misdiagnosis. Everyone said she was too young. It couldn't be colorectal cancer, even though she had classic colorectal cancer symptoms, which are abdominal pain, constipation, and bloody stool. Jacqueline had just begun her sophomore year of college at the University of San Diego, enjoying her journey into adulthood, and she had big dreams. Jacqueline was always healthy and fit. She loved playing the piano, cooking, West Coast swing dancing, playing sports, soccer was her favorite, her yellow lab, and just living life. All that changed in an instant in 2010, when two days before Christmas, and just a few months after she turned 20, she was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. At age 16, Jacqueline and I went to her pediatrician to explain her symptoms even though I let her doctor know that her paternal grandfather had died of colorectal cancer, she said, you just don't develop colorectal cancer at this age. We believed her doctor because we had never heard of anyone that young having colorectal cancer. It took several doctors, two trips to the emergency room, and four years for Jacqueline to be properly diagnosed with colorectal cancer. After her diagnosis, she was tested for Lynch syndrome because of her age, as those with Lynch syndrome may develop cancers at a much younger age than usual. That was when we learned that Jacqueline inherited Lynch syndrome from her dad, Alan. After her Lynch syndrome diagnosis, we told all of our doctors, um, our primary care doctors, my OBGYN, um, about Jacqueline's diagnosis with Lynch, and none of them, not one of them, knew what Lynch syndrome was. In spite of Jacqueline's grueling treatment, including several surgeries, chemotherapy, and radiation, Jacqueline was determined to graduate from college. And she, and she proudly walked with her class, earning a double major in marketing and Spanish. Tragically, in 2014, Jacqueline lost her life at the young age of 23. Had Jacqueline's symptoms been taken seriously, or had we known Lynch syndrome was in Alan's family, I have no doubt that Jacqueline's symptoms would have been taken seriously and she would still be here today. I feel Jacqueline's death was caused by the perfect storm. We didn't know Lynch syndrome was in Alan's family's genes. Her doctors thought she was too young to have colorectal cancer. And um, had any one of those things been different, her story most likely would have had a different ending. After Jacqueline died, we started the Jacqueline Rush Foundation spurred by the fact that our physicians didn't know what Lynch syndrome was, including my gynecologist, which shocked me because those with Lynch syndrome have a high risk of developing uterine cancer. Um, another reason that we started the foundation was because of Jacqueline's personal mission. We gave her a book her um, senior year of high school, and it was kind of like a workbook. It was called, Where Will You Be Five Years From Today? And in that book, she wrote her personal mission, which was to love living my life and have a positive impact on the lives of those I know and cherish but also to those who I simply encounter. To know that mistakes are made to learn and to embrace all knowledge. So we started the Jacqueline Fun Rush Foundation to continue her personal mission in her honor so that other families may not have the same tragic outcome. So what is Lynch syndrome? Um, as Beth said, um, Lynch syndrome is a common inherited genetic cancer syndrome that significantly increases the risk of colorectal, uterine, and many other cancers compared to the general population. It's surprisingly common, but most people don't know about it, including many physicians. So our mission at the Jacqueline Rush Foundation is to save lives by improving the public and medical community awareness of Lynch syndrome 
and to raise funds for Lynch syndrome research. We also provide education, support, and resources to Lynch syndrome carriers and their families. We're building a community so that nobody is alone. So one thing I wanna say right up front is that having Lynch syndrome does not mean you'll definitely get cancer. It just means that you have a higher risk than the general population. Somebody with Lynch syndrome may develop one cancer, more than one cancer, or none at all during their lifetime. Um, Lynch syndrome occurs when a person inherits a mutation in one of the mismatch repair genes responsible for DNA repair. When these mismatch repair genes don't work properly, errors can occur and accumulate, which can lead to uncontrolled cell growth and cancer. Now, currently we know that, that there are five genes that have been identified with causing Lynch syndrome. There are MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2, and FCAM. So we all have these Lynch syndrome genes, but when you inherit a copy of one of these genes that doesn't work right, that's when you have Lynch syndrome. Um, approximately one in 279 people have Lynch syndrome, and 95% of those are not aware that they have Lynch syndrome. So we have a lot of work to do to spread this awareness. Now, how do you inherit Lynch syndrome? If one of your parents has Lynch syndrome, you have a 50% chance of inheriting the gene regardless of your biological sex. The two biggest risks uh, for people with Lynch syndrome are developing colorectal cancer. They have a 61% chance over their lifetime and a 57% risk of developing endometrial cancer. Now proper screening can greatly reduce these risks. Your risk of cancers associated with Lynch syndrome differs depending on which Lynch syndrome gene you carry. Also too, um, your family history, cancer history makes a big difference in what cancers you might be at more risk for. Because someone who has a Lynch syndrome gene that may have a really high risk for colorectal cancer, they might have pancreatic cancer in their family. So it's really kind of a combination of the two. Um, one of the surprising things that most people don't know is that Lynch syndrome is not rare. It is 43% more common in the population to have Lynch syndrome than having one of the BRCA gene risk mutations for um, breast and ovarian cancer. And most people have never heard of it, although mostly everybody has heard of the, the breast cancer risk gene mutations. So every day, approximately 39 people in the US are born with Lynch syndrome. And most of those people, if we continue at the awareness rate that we have now, won't know they have it. So Lynch syndrome is the most common cause of inherited colorectal and endometrial cancer. And these are just a few of the risks that you have on this chart. Um, and again, it really depends on which particular gene mutation you have and what your family history is. So if you look at the um, chart, the top numbers have the risk for people with Lynch syndrome. And then on the bottom, it's the general population's risk for these cancers. So you can see that if you have Lynch syndrome, you have a pretty, a, a much higher risk for some of the cancers than the general population. Um, other cancers that um, are, are um, included in Lynch syndrome are renal cancer, ureter cancer, bladder, gastric, which is stomach cancer, smile ball, smile, so sorry, smile, small bowel, pancreas, <clears throat> um, biliary tract, prostate, brain, and skin. And those have smaller risks um, than colorectal and endometrial and ovarian. So um, the cancer screening recommendations and risk-reducing strategies from the National Cancer Comprehensive 
network are dependent on the specific gene mutation you have, again, which I said combined with your family history. So why is Lynch syndrome not wor more well known? Well, that's a big question because mm -hmm. you would think that something that's more popular than these breast cancer gene risk mutations would also be just as well known. So one of our goals is to make Lynch syndrome as well known in the general population and the medical community as the BRCA inherited gene mutations for breast and ovarian cancer. So what can you guys do to help? Well, you can help us spread the word by educating your family, friends, and physicians about Lynch syndrome, learning about your family cancer history, be proactive, consider genetic testing to know what's in your genes. I feel that um, knowing what's in your genes gives you the opportunity to change your genetic destiny instead of leaving it up to fate. And there are so many things you can do, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, if you know you have Lynch syndrome that greatly reduce your risk of cancers. Um, so, you know, my big takeaway is it shouldn't take a cancer diagnosis to find out you have inherited Lynch syndrome. The key to preventing cancer or catching it early when it can be cured is knowing what's in your genes and what your cancer risks are. Had we known that like I said before, had we known Jacqueline had Lynch syndrome when we took her to the pediatrician, we could have given her pediatrician that information and she would have had proper screening with a colonoscopy when she was 16. So um, the Jacqueline Rush Foundation raises awareness for Lynch syndrome, both in the general population and medical community, also providing support education for those affected by Lynch syndrome. So the, this is all of our, our contact information if you wanna learn more. Um, and we'll be um, talking about some more things about Lynch syndrome with Beth. Thank you so much um, for, for that overview. And we're gonna have some time to um, dig in a little bit and, and come to some actionable um, additional actionable things for folks to do. So I just want to invite everyone who's attending the webinar to enter questions that you might have for Joan and Alan into the chat. Um, and I'll get us started, started off um, by asking, how can we get tested for Lynch syndrome? Okay, so we have uh, quite a few slides with information. So I'm going to be flying through them to find the one that <laughs> answers your question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, here we go. Okay, so right. genetic testing is just a simple blood test or a sample or a saliva sample. Um, typically, when Jacqueline first got diagnosed, they only tested her for Lynch syndrome, uh, which cost about three thousand dollars. Now you can get a whole panel with many cancer risk genes that are included for about $249. And we always suggest having an appointment with a certified genetic counselor um, to be made prior to genetic testing to ensure the proper genetic tests are ordered and the implications of genetic testing are explained. Um, genetic testing is often covered by insurance. If you have a family history that meets criteria, for genetic testing, um, but if not covered, like I said, the out-of-pocket cost should not exceed $250. So there was a recent study and they did just kind of like a population whole genome sequencing mm -hmm. on a large number of people. 56% of the people who tested positive for Lynch syndrome in that study didn't meet the current NCCN guidelines for testing. Alan's family cancer history didn't meet those guidelines either. So I have a lot of people who always say, well, you know, I don't need genetic testing because I don't have a lot of cancer in my family. Well, the only person in Alan's family that had cancer was his father. And so that's not a lot of people either. So. I just kind of want to reiterate that, that 
um, you can have Lynch syndrome, even if you don't have a large family cancer history. And I think that's something important for people to know. So um, just if anybody's interested in talking to a certified genetic counselor, we have the link up there on how you, to find one and you can search um, you know, by state or by your city. And a lot of genetic counselors now are doing virtual um, calls. So you don't necessarily have to find a person that's in your state or area. That's that's great. Um, really helpful, really helpful information. And we have a um, some activity in the chat. Um, some of it only the hosts and panelists can see, so I'll share those. And some everybody can see. So we just want to make sure that everyone knows what the conversation uh, is. So um, there's three thank yous right away when you started presenting from people who uh, are, are living with Lynch syndrome. Um, and I'll just, you know, read, read one of them, um, which is, uh, as you said, knowing can change everything. In a family with 10 young cancer deaths, instead of waiting for my turn to die of cancer, I'm a 67 year old survivor, thanks to genetic testing. So, um, you know, there's a success story in terms of getting the word out um, in the midst to, of a lot of loss in one family. Um, there's a, uh, Julie Moskowitz has posted, um, I am a, well, she says, thank you so much, Joan and Alan, for sharing Jacqueline's story. It's so important. I'm a genetic counselor that works in oncology, so I'm very passionate about this topic. I'm wondering if you've worked with genetic counselors in the past and if there's anything genetic counselors can do specifically to help raise awareness. Yeah, we actually have um, a, a couple genetic counselors on our medical advisory board. One is Heather Hample, who I call the queen of Lynch syndrome genetic counseling. Mm. Um, she, she actually was, was, let me just back up a little bit. So there is a, a current recommendation from NCCN um, for all colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer tumors to be tested for possible Lynch syndrome. You can test the tumor for a, a particular molecular makeup that suggests you might have Lynch syndrome. Um, and Heather was a big part of getting those recommendations in place. And that has helped a lot of people to get um, identified with Lynch syndrome if they didn't already know that they had it. So um, I think um, what can genetic counselors do to help get the word out? Um, you know, one of the one of our big pushes right now is to get this information out in the in the media. So um, we were able to get Curdy. Katie Couric, who was the um, prior um, anchor of the Today Show, to put Jacqueline's story and um, stuff about Lynch syndrome in her newsletter, which has a big reach. So we've also had some things that we've gotten on our local news stations, and that's one way to educate the public, um, because I feel that we don't have any control over what our what our doctor's knowledge is. But if we had the knowledge, like if we had had the knowledge that Jacqueline had Lynch syndrome, or even just that Alan had Lynch syndrome, we could have educated her doctor and things would have been different. Very helpful. Um... And I'll just note that Julie knows Heather and says she's uh, one of the best, so connections there. Um, I also wanna um, share some information from the director of our student health center who's attending, um, Dr. Stephen Bowers. And so Dr. Bowers says, thanks for the great talk and information locally. So this is important for anyone living in the Lehigh Valley. St. Luke's Hospital Network has free genetic testing for common genetic mutations, including Lynch syndrome. So that is great news um, for all great. of us locally. So um, thanks so much, Dr. Bowers, um, for sharing that. 
Um, yeah, I, uh, I also wanted to mention, Beth, that um, if you can't afford $249 to get genetic testing, there are nonprofit foundations that offer free genetic testing, pay for your genetic testing, and some genetic testing labs also offer financial assistance. So, um, you know, if the cost is prohibitive, then there are ways that you can still get genetic testing. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, are there any other obstacles to getting testing that you guys would want to address? You've addressed some for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there's a few. Yeah. Um, yeah. So people have asked me like, Okay, so now you've told me about Lynch syndrome. Can I go to my physician, my primary care doctor, and say, I learned about this inherited genetic mutation that gives high risk for cancers and I want to get tested? Well, you can do that. Your physician may suggest that you don't need genetic testing. Um, so a couple things you can do about that is you can um, either get a second opinion from another doctor, third opinion from another doctor, or a lot of genetic counselors can also order genetic testing. So you can make an appointment with a genetic counselor. Um, there are some states though that they're not licensed to um, order genetic testing, but if you went to a genetic counselor and together you decided that you should get genetic testing, then Hopefully they could send information to your physician um, and that would sway them in that regard. Uh, we talked a little bit already about your insurance won't cover genetic testing. So how, how could you get that covered? Um, one of the big things I hear too is you might be afraid that you'll be discriminated against based on your genetic testing results. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2008, the federal government passed the GINA Act. And that, that prevents health insurers and employers from um, discriminating against you based on your genetic information and also your family's genetic information. So um, you're, they can't, like your, your health insurance provider can't like use um, Lynch syndrome, the diagnosis as a pre-existing condition. They can't charge you more money for your premiums. Um, your employer can't discriminate against you based on your genetic information. They can't pay you less. They can't not promote you. All of those things um, because you have um, genetic information that may give you higher risks for things. So we also have the um, QR code for, that gives you kind of a summary of what Gina, Gina does and how it protects you. It does not cover life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. So we always suggest that if you're going to consider genetic testing, if you're interested in getting those um, types of insurance that you do it before you get genetic testing. I'm not saying that an, that an insurance company wouldn't cover you, but they, they don't, you don't have protection against that for those types of insurance. Yeah, that's, um, thank you. Um, so we have a question that's kind of stepping back before testing. Um, are there signs of Lynch syndrome that one can use to decide whether to get tested? Well, there's not really any sign in particular that you have Lynch syndrome unless you've had several different cancers or you have a family history, cancer history that has a lot of cancer in it. Um, so, you know, just by looking at somebody or how, by how you feel, you wouldn't know that you have Lynch syndrome. So the only way to really find that out is by doing genetic testing. Hmm. So um, we have a, a question that's really about 
what what next, right? So um, this attendee says, after two bouts of cancer, my mom got genetic testing done and found out she has Lynch syndrome. My sister and I got genetic testing and are also positive. What steps would you recommend next? So what can you do if you test positive for Lynch syndrome? Yeah, so there are many things that you can do. Um, one of the things I want to say about Lynch syndrome is, is number one, it's not a death sentence. And number two, there is a lot of hope for people who have Lynch syndrome. The things that you can do currently now is um, you can get colonoscopies every one to three years um, in those with Lynch syndrome. And the reason that you have to do it so frequently is colorectal cancer polyps develop into cancer in two to three years. And in the general population, it's 10 to 12. So, you know, doing just the general population screening is not enough. So colonoscopies are the only test that can prevent colorectal cancer. So when you get a colonoscopy and they find polyps, they remove them before they can become cancerous. And that reduces your risk of colorectal cancer significantly. Um, there were two, two studies in the UK um, showing that taking aspirin daily for at least two years in people that have Lynch syndrome can reduce the risk of developing colorectal cancer by approximately 50%. Again, that's another very simple, very inexpensive thing that you can do. Um, the interesting thing about that study was that the original study lasted for two years. And so people were on aspirin for two years. And then a lot of the people stopped taking aspirin after two years. Now at the two year mark, they didn't find any reduction in the risk of developing colorectal cancer. But some people continued on aspirin and some people stopped. But at the five year mark, all of a sudden they started seeing this reduction. They followed these people for over 20 years and they still have that same re reduction in risk, even though they're not taking aspirin anymore, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And in that same study, um, one of the arms of the trial was they had people take 30 grams of resistant starch daily and resistant starch is just starch that resists getting digested in your stomach and makes it to your colon intact. Um, and so it does a lot of good things in there. They thought that it might reduce the risk of colorectal cancer, but it didn't. But what it did show was those people who were on the resistant starch arm, it reduced their non-colorectal Lynch syndrome cancers by over 40% and by even more over 60% for upper GI cancers like pancreatic, stomach, small bowel, et cetera. And so it was like pancreatic cancer is really hard to screen for. Most people get diagnosed when it's, it's well advanced. So where do you get resistant starch? Well, it's in a lot of things that you eat commonly. Um, bananas, but they need to be on the greenish side because once they turn yellow, it turns into regular starch. Mm -hmm. um, lentils, green peas, beans, pasta, rice, potatoes. Um, we have a resistant starch guide that we'll share at the end, and that can also be printed off of our website. Mm -hmm. It has a QR code for different um, recipes that have resistant starch. So that if you're thinking like, how am I gonna incorporate that into my diet? There's some ways there. Um, the other thing that reduces your risks um, is doing risk-reducing surgeries like um, for such cancers as, as endometrial and ovarian. So just like the people who have the BRCA genes, they'll get a, a prophylactic mastectomy to reduce the risk of breast cancer and also get their ovaries removed, the same kind of thing. Um, typically, immunotherapy is a more effective treatment for Lynch syndrome-related cancers than chemotherapy. 
So if you don't know your tumor is caused by Lynch syndrome, you might not be getting the most effective treatment. And this is, this is something that I'm really excited about. There's currently two clinical trials testing vaccines that may prevent cancer in ind individuals with Lynch syndrome. And there are a couple vaccines that we already have that prevent cancer, but they are things that, um, cancers that are caused by viruses like the HPV vaccine and the hepatitis vaccine. This is the first vaccine that will prevent cancer from happening in the first place. And I think it has a lot of promise. So that's another reason that you would wanna know if you have Lynch syndrome, because if these work, that's gonna be a game changer. Um, and we have just a little disclaimer here that you should consult your physician before starting any medication such as aspirin um, and consult a physician or a registered dietitian before adding additional resistant starch to your diet because you might have some kind of dietary restrictions that you can't eat certain things. I just want to also um, acknowledge that Alan shared that he's in a clinical trial uh, for Lynch syndrome. Alan, did you want to say any more about that? Um, yeah, I can say a little bit. Uh, the uh, the trial, one of the two trials that's going on is um, one in which there's a um, uh, a placebo. So it was random, you know, when we started it. But I pretty soon figured out that I had actually got the the real um, vaccine, uh, mostly because of the side effects that uh, come with it. It's they're minor side effects, uh, similar to the kinds of effects that you saw when you got the uh, uh, the COVID uh, vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's going on, and um, the next big uh, sort of milestone is that uh, when I get my colonoscopy next year, they will do a a thorough um, examination of any kind of polyps. Hopefully, there will be no polyps, which would be a sign that the vaccine's working. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, a fair amount of follow-up after that. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> That's, um, I mean, you guys are doing, I think every single thing you can to make progress, to help support the progress on this. So, um, and in that vein, we have a couple of questions about educating caregivers. Um, and so I'll read both questions. Um, the first, um, I am an MLH1 Lynchy who is a endometrial cancer survivor due to a gynecologist who would not allow me to blame my symptoms on my fibroids. Additionally, her colleague and friend, an oncologist recommended testing because I was 40 at the time of my cancer diagnosis. In my opinion, in addition to knowing your family medical history, educating cl clinicians, especially medical students is key and then a second person says, do you encounter physicians and clinicians still referring to testing for Lynch syndrome as part of the Jewish panel? While I do happen to have Ashkenazi heritage, I found that so many doctors still believe Lynch exists only for those within the Ashkenazi community. I fear that's detrimental to our effort to encourage testing. For sure. Yeah, I'm. there are a lot of uh, groups that have besides the Jewish population that has a, um, a higher prevalence. Um, and that's just because, you know, they might marry somebody who has their same um, ancestry. But we do have, we put together this handout that, that patients could give to their physicians. Um, to educate their physicians about Lynch syndrome because that's one of the most common questions I get. Um, uh, people say, I'm really tired of educating my physicians um, and I don't really understand everything about Lynch syndrome. So we put together this um, handout that they can take to their physicians who don't know about Lynch syndrome. It explains everything. It talks about, you know, the statistics, how, how you inherit it, what risk to other family members there are if you tested positive for Lynch syndrome. 
I can't, again, the cancer risks associated with Lynch syndrome, how you manage those risks. I talked about the NCCN guidelines, um, which break down each particular gene mutation and according to what the risks are for that particular gene mutation, they have screening recommendations. Um, so this is a QR code that the physician can click on and get directly to that information. How you get tested for information or for Lynch syndrome, how you can find a genetic counselor, how you can find a physician that's educated in Lynch syndrome. And then just what I talked about before the importance of identifying those with Lynch syndrome, because there are all these things that you can do to reduce your risk or prevent cancer. Um, there's also a QR code on the bottom that goes directly to, to clinicaltrials.gov with information about these two vaccine trials. So I think this is something that even if you don't have Lynch syndrome and you're interested in getting tested for it and you wanna educate your physicians that you can give them this. Um, and like I said, we have it, it's on our website. Um, we've got the QR code, or not the QR code, but the URL down at the bottom. And these are all downloadable, printable. And so you're welcome to do that. Um, you know, one of the things we've been thinking of too is how do we get more education about Lynch syndrome into the medical school curriculum? So that's something we're trying to make happen. Also, um, because I've heard from, you know, recent doctors who've come out, it's like, oh yeah, we learned about Lynch syndrome, but like it was a 10 minute discussion. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we need to get, we need to get more physicians, more educated. Yep. That's, um, thank you uh, for your work in that area. Um, obviously incredibly important and it's a way to amplify um, this message is to reach out to people who uh, might actually see people who carry the the Lynch, uh, who might have Lynch syndrome. So right. um, we have a, a couple of bits of advice from people who are attending the webinar. So um, one person recommends that if you are going to get tested for Lynch syndrome, that you buy um, life insurance first, not after. Um, since yeah. as one pointed out, you that's not protected um, by the same law that protects right. um, you if yeah. in terms of getting health insurance. So, yeah. um, so that's good advice. Yeah, that's what we do recommend. I think I may have mentioned that, but yes, yeah. definitely. If you're interested in that, disability insurance and long-term health care insurance, those are the, the three that are not protected. Now there are some states who have additional protections, so you may have that protection in your state. But you need to, um, you know, find out that information. Mm -hmm. um, not all states do, but there are states that um, prohibit life insurance companies from discriminating based on your genetic information. So whatever state you're in, you can check that out to see if they have additional policies. Um, yeah, that's that's great advice too. So one last bit of advice from the... Um from those listening. So um, Dr. Henry Dorkin notes that it's always important to stress um, that a negative screening test does not guarantee absence of a problem, but just lowers the probability. Um, so you also, we also wanna be aware of the signs and symptoms for colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer and others sure. related to Lynch syndrome um, mm -hmm. and to look, look for those and act on them. Um, even if you have a negative test in terms of the Lynch syndrome, but we have to unfortunately stop. We have some um, additional um, thoughts and thank yous and other people who've lost family members um, reaching out. So um, I just wanted to give you guys the final word um, to see if you have a, a call to action. I mean, I see that Bryce has put into the chat, the link to your um, website and someone else has endorse the website as the best information mm -hmm. on um, Lynch syndrome. So that's great. Any other um, calls to action that you would add? And oh, uh, actually, if I can put in one first, we're recording this. It'll be available on our, U our YouTube. Um, Bryce can tell us more about that. But if anyone hears this and said, boy, I wish this person who I care about had heard this, you can send the video. Right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, and that's another way to spread awareness, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I just want to say is um, not knowing you have Lynch syndrome doesn't change the fact that you have Lynch syndrome. So knowing what's in your genes is really powerful. You can see all the things that you could do to reduce your risks. Um, and I think the other thing I want to say is that what people don't know sometimes is the statistics for the general population for cancer are that one in two men and one in three women will get some type of cancer in their lifetime. So um, even though you have these high risks and it's a difficult, it's a difficult um, diagnosis for sure, um, you know, mentally, um, I just want you to know that there's hope out there. There's a lot of research being done in Lynch syndrome now. Um, once they figured out that Lynch syndrome tumors responded well to immunotherapy, um, that sparked a whole spurt of Lynch syndrome research. And um, I just want to thank everybody for yep. listening. And thanks for your questions. And yeah, thanks, Beth, for having us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and shout out to all of the uh, Lehigh alumni. Yeah. Um, and um, hopefully this was uh, helpful. And all the lynchies out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for educating us. Yeah. We really appreciate it. And it's life saving. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Joan, so much for, for sharing the presentation with us today and sharing this information. Um, I did put the link again in the chat for anybody who's still on that wants to jump into the website right away. Um, as well, thank you, Beth, for, for hosting and moderating our conversation. Um, I certainly feel more educated and, and more empowered to, to learn more about my own genetic history. So um, if anybody has any questions, um, uh, Alan Joan is the website, the best uh, avenue to, to reach you guys. Yeah, or they can they can reach out on the um, the um, email, which is admin at jrushfoundation.org. Also, I just wanted to say really quickly, there's a couple different um, hospital systems in the country that have Lynch syndrome centers. Mm -hmm. um, UCSF in San Francisco, Dana Farber in um, Boston, and also Penn in Philadelphia. And so that's a place where you can go that all of your doctors for all of your screenings are very well versed on Lynch syndrome and they coordinate with each other. Um, so those are resources for people who live in those areas also. Wonderful. Yeah, I know we have a, a large number of alums in the Bay Area, the Boston and the Philadelphia area. So that'd be a great resource for them. Um, so with that, I, I think we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up the presentation. Um, thank you everyone so much for for joining us and, and engaging in the conversation. Um, please go visit the the website uh, to learn more um, and reach out to Alan and Joan if you have any additional questions. But with that, we'll we'll give you guys the back uh, the time for your afternoon, um, and we we hope to see you again for the next one. So have a good day, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bryce. Thank you. Don't read that. Looks like there's about. a few people still on, but they're dropping off. But I just wanted to say goodbye and thanks, and um, yep. hope to be yes. in touch soon. Uh, did you hear anything from Katie Couric? No. <laughs> yeah, me either. So <laughs> we'll keep trying. Yeah. I know. Well, I, I I'm pretty sure I'll see her in March, so I'll certainly. Oh, good. Seeing her memory about you. Yeah, and, um, I don't think it was very brief, and. Um, yeah, she saw a lot of people, so I would not expect her to remember. Yeah. Well, she might remember you because you're you're the dean of health. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So, um, anyway, great to see you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we'll see you on uh, November twelfth. That's right. Okay, oh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Terrific. I keep yeah. going. What's happening on November twelfth? You forgot. <laughs>